Hey everybody, welcome, Whee! welcome, sis, with GNU Geeks. It's not pronounced Gwix at all. No. You probably Gwix. thought it was, but it's Geeks. Or Gwix. Yeah, it's not Gwix either. You probably were like, oh yeah, that looks like Gwix or Gwix, but it's not. It's Geeks because the main author is French, except that excuse no longer works now that I know French people who don't think it sounds like that. <laughs> um, but uh, well, yeah, welcome. So we're gonna solve it today. By the time this talk is done, it's solved. Yeah, solved. don't worry, it'll be great. Done. Okay, so all right, let's setting the stage. Let's get it. Let's get into this talk. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Wait. Who is David Thompson? David Thompson, this guy right here. David Thompson is my Hi, friend. Buddy. He's a contributor to GNU Guile and many other GNU Guile related projects. I don't know if I should hold this thing. Yeah. No, it doesn't go very far. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> He, uh, he works on a number of cool guile re and scheme related things. He has a game engine called Fly, which is functional reactive programming. He also is one of the people who got me into geeks, convinced me when I was like, oh, we gotta solve this problem. I'm gonna go this direction or this direction or this direction. He's like, look at geeks, look at geeks. And then it ends up being worth you. it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and eventually I've become convinced. And, and so, yeah. Uh -huh. All right. and, uh, you should speak into the microphone. Okay. Yes. But yeah. who's Chris Weber? How many people know Chris Weber? Chris Weber's pretty famous around here, right? Yeah, pretty okay. much everyone. But actually, a lot of people don't. So Chris Weber is the lead maintainer of GNU Media Goblin. Yeah. Of, sure. Uh, of, of a very important project, if you don't know about it, for um, will soon be federated media sharing. Um, he's currently working on a W3C working group for a federation standard. Um, he's also become a bit of a Guile programmer lately. Yeah. Uh, he's working on an asynchronous uh, programming library for Guile, kind of a la uh, Python's uh, async await. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Yeah. That's All Chris. Right. Yeah. Hey. So let's uh, let's away. yeah let's jump into the talk. So this is the what we want, right? And this is the, like the picture of the internet that they show you in class bu uh, textbooks, right? It's this decentralized thing, you know. One of these nodes go down. It's okay. You can just route around it. Super great, right? Like this is like the vision of the internet that we think about and would like to have. But this is the actual like direction that the internet's heading, right? You've got this large centralized silo in the middle, and we're kind of like sucking on the edges of it. Like, you know, please accept my video to YouTube. If it goes down, that'll be so sad, you know. Uh, um, and, uh, um, and you've got this big centralized provider, right? So, and, and unfortunately, this is subject to censorship, right? You know, somebody can come in and they're like, ha, ah, you know, copyright violation, or I don't like you, or I'm going to be something or other, um, or I'm some sort of state agency that says you have to take this down or something like that. And what's a big centralized provider going to do? They'll probably just take it down, right? So um, we're also, you know, hey, Snowden Keynote, right? We're very aware of the state of surveillance. And in a large system, it's very easy to have something that can actually just look from the inside at everybody, right? So this isn't the version of things we want, right? So um, and this is also kind of a problem because, you know, you might have this big central thing. And, you know, you're like, oh, well, it looks pretty robust. It's pretty big, right? Of course, big things can pop. And when they <laughs> pop, everything around them pops. You know, so it's not what we want, right? So that's a sad internet. So, so, so like, I'm like, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna work on this project called Media Goblin. We're gonna bring it to the people. We're gonna have decentralized video, media, video, image, and blah, blah, blah sharing. This will be great. And I've been doing this for the last few years. And it's like, yeah, you know, yeah, we're gonna make this happen. Except, oh no, oh no. I'm afraid to deploy my own software and upgrade it. And I get people who deploy it and they're like, this is great. And then they're like, oh no, I did a, a, an app get upgrade and then my virtual arms broke and everything's terrible and I'm so sad. You know, and like, so this is like to the point where I took a sabbatical this year to look into what, what we can do because it's, it's such a problem. So, so what can we do in the age where, you know, almost nobody, including the people who write the stuff, can really keep on top of deploying and, and keeping you know web services like this stuff running, right? I, I do DevOps for a living, and I have a hard time uh, right. self-hosting my own things and finding the time to maintain them. Yeah, we want we want to go beyond DevOps to user apps, right? User-facing deployment stuff. Unfortunately, these systems. One of the reasons why we we end up in this phase is that these deployment systems that we have are dependent on the phase of the moon of some sort of packaging system, right? You know, you you. Uh, um, I once had a hackathon where I spent the whole prior day making sure, in fact, it's just happened yesterday again. Uh, I spent the prior day uh, um, making sure that, okay, everything's installing right, great. This package system and this package system align, everything's gonna be fine. And then I show up the next day, oh, somebody updated something in the package index and on the Python package index, people's installs aren't working. Oh no, and I spent three hours trying to fix it and then I eventually people who showed up and they're like, I can't wait to become a contributor are like, oh, well, I guess I'm not gonna be a contributor now and they walk away, right? What a crappy situation. I never want to be in that situation again, right? So you're dependent on the phase of the moon of this distribution, whether or not it's a, your, your GNU Linux distribution or your language distribution, and, and it's not great, right? This kind of time-based 
like uh, fixing is, is kind of sad, right? So, and we're now in the world of one language packager per child, right? You know, like, uh, you know, like, and it's like, you know, every language wants to be cool now. You're like, I'm a cool language. I'm Go, I'm Rust or whatever, right? All those other languages, they have cool package managers. Let me have one too, right? Now people will take me seriously. Yeah, you know what it's like to run a pro modern project where you have Python packages working with core Debian or like Fedora's packages, and then you've got like, and then you eventually you have JavaScript things, and it's like, wait, you shouldn't check those into Git, maybe for some reason, you know? So like, oh, okay, well we'll use npm, and now we've got Bower, and, and now you have, side. yeah, now you have to become an expert in every single one of these systems, right? It's terrible. It's terrible. This is not a great state of the world, even though like everybody's like, yeah, let's have this. And this is one of the reasons why we're we're in this state of like giving up deployment, right? It's like it's too hard to keep track of all these things. So you know, so. And, and let's not forget about, you know, configuration management, right? You know, yeah, this is, a tar, this is a tar pit, right? Who here is familiar with the term Turing tar pit, right? You might not be familiar with it. It basically means a language in which everything is possible, but everything is difficult at the same time, right? Like, uh, not, everything is possible, but terrible to do, right? And uh, many configuration management systems, I was very interested when I started my sabbatical, like, well, you know, you might be deploying Media Goblin and you might be deploying Media Goblin. Surely these, these configuration steps are pretty similar, right? So we should have recipes and stuff like this. What, where's Ansible and Salt's recipes things? Most of them are like, oh yeah, we have them. Just download it from my GitHub and your GitHub and then change them so that you'll never be able to synchronize them together, right? And, like, and then they're like, oh yeah, well don't worry. Uh, our, we're using YAML or some other terrible language like this. And uh, don't worry because it's not Turing complete. Except, oh wait, we really need for loops. We need conditionals. We need some way to substitute variables. So like Salt and Ansible use YAML files and you use a web templating language to, to be able to, to the generate the, the YAML. So now you have like the worst combination of everything because you're like, no Turing completeness. Oh wait, we need it. And yeah, now you're in tar pit zone. So, so sad things. So people are like, Docker. This is the answer, right? Like yeah. Docker or something like We're it, done. right? Docker's the answer. Right? It's done. Docker's the answer and a talk, right? So like, uh, I built it for you. No problem. You can just run it on your machine and I already solved all the hard parts because, and because, because you don't have to worry about it. Well, this sounds pretty good, right? What a great logo. You've got a whale with these containers on its back. It's very reassuring. Millions of dollars <laughs> behind this company. I'm feeling confident. So. But there might not be, this might not be the best situation, it turns out. These containers might not be as stable of a situation as we thought they were. Um, uh, there's some problems with these, right? So each one of these containers is effectively a statically compiled um, distribution as a binary, um, which might have some of its own problems. You're like, oh yeah, well don't worry. You know, they can like diff between the versions. So, you know, I've done merges in Git with text files, so I, I don't really want to do merges as things change between giant binary distributions. So I'm not sure that really works. So you end up having very heavy things where we throw out the great ideas of dynamic linking uh, for, for, you know, basically distribution-sized static compilation. These are really hard to introspect, right? When you're like, oh, don't worry. I figured it out for you. Yeah, but what happens when you need to look inside of this, right? So there's an analysis of Docker Hub. You, uh, I don't know if all of you have seen this. So over 70% of the top 100 images on Docker Hub have medium to high level vulnerabilities. And 30 to 40% have shell shock and heart bleed le uh, level vulnerabilities when this blog post went out. Wow, that is not really awesome. Uh, I would say pretty not awesome, um, especially not as like these things come out every day. Um, like new vulnerabilities all the time. And is it reproducible? Um, I mean, it's not reproducible as in the sense of reproducible builds. There'll be more talk on this here. Uh, and Docker's DSL is really not expressive, right? You know, like you can't really do everything that you might want to be able to do. And you're still dependent, you're still dependent on this guy, right? Somebody who built this thing was still dependent on this. And if shell shock or whatever ends up happening, you're, you know, the, this whole situation, you might not be able to actually reproduce this thing at all because the, the fa state of, phase of the moon might have changed. How many people use Docker currently? Yeah, a number of hands. Yeah. I, I'm not, I, I, I empathize with why Docker has become so big, you know? And it's, it's not just Docker, right? Like, I think that, sorry. Uh, no, no, I was wondering, have, have uh, people been told not to run uh, app get upgrade in their Docker containers and their Docker it's files? It's in the official FAQ, don't right. run app get upgrade, right? right? So, so. Um, 
so, uh, um, so unfortunately, this is just not just Docker, right? We're seeing a lot more of this like encouragement, like, oh yeah, the the like you know like the the giving up the like f it I'm out version of like deployment, right? Like the uh, this is too hard to figure out, so we'll just put it in this thing for you. Frozen you know, pizza driven development. Yeah, that's right. Put the pizza together once, freeze it, and just deliver it to people. Yeah, that's right. So we've got CoreOS. Um, even unfortunately, GNOME I think is heading in this direction with XDG app. Um, I mean, the sandboxing is great, but everything else I'm not sure about. Uh, Cubes is going, you know, snappy, and, and I actually think that we're losing the ability to reason about free software. This is a really dangerous direction. I think that this is a policy issue disguised as a technical issue. Like, and we are getting to the point where we no longer often know how to build and no longer get to the point where we no longer how to safely modify our applications. That is a really bad direction for software freedom. Really bad. Um, if it's hard to build, run, and, main and modify software, what does, that, what, what does that mean for software freedom? That's like, you know, those are our core principles. So here we are. We have large centralized applications. We have containers falling off of them. You know, this is the <laughs> state of the world that we live in. And I'm, I'm, this is not the direction that I want to, things to be in. I like this picture because the whale thinks everything is fine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so... So enter Geeks and Geeks SD. I'm going to let my friend David take over from this point. Thank you, Chris. So Chris is a much better speaker than I am, so I'm going to fumble through this. So here's our nice logo. Chris has it on a T-shirt. I have it on a T-shirt. We don't have T-shirts yet, but we're going sometime. to switch T-shirts tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, we're going to introduce a concept called functional package management. And when most people think about functional, they think, oh, you know, well, apt-get works, right? RPM works. Well, I don't mean that it works. We mean mathematics, that you know, given the same inputs to something, you get the same output. And in the functional package management world, uh, dependencies are precisely specified. And I don't mean saying that you know, uh, Media Goblin depends on you know, version you know, uh, Python between you know, 2.7 and greater. I meant, well, this package depends on Python with these, compiled with these particular flags, with these particular dependencies, all the way down to what we call the bootstrap binaries, the compiler's compiler. So we actually have. Um, things very explicit. So this, you know, this is not, you know, your average kind of packaging paradigm. Um, so as in the Snowden conversation, um, DKG mentioned re reproducible builds. I don't know if anyone uh, caught that. Um, and there's a talk tomorrow um, by the Debian people um, about this. But Geek says it too. We're working on it. Um, there's a reproduciblebuilds.org site that um, has a lot of uh, projects that are involved here. Thanks, Debian, for doing a lot of the hard work for us. Yes, yeah, th yeah big thanks to Debian on this one. <laughs> uh, we pull a lot of their fixes. Um, so the other important thing is that built packages are immutable. Uh, so we know with the traditional distribution, you know, we're familiar with you know the slash usr directory, right? And then when we install a package, we just like shove stuff in there and modify it. And sometimes something's broken in there, and we go in there and we tweak it and make it work for us. You don't do that in in, uh, in geeks. Um, so the result of a package is immutable, and for that we get consistency and we get reliability from it. Um, you can also manage packages uh, without being the root user, uh, unprivileged. Um, that's very important. It means uh, you're not under the, the, you know, the, the power of a sysadmin or, you know, different users can use different things. And we also get atomic upgrades and rollbacks, uh, which means that either a package installation or actually a reversal of a package installation will either work or nothing happens. You could unplug the power cord, something, other, something bad could happen in the build process, and you'd never be left in an inconsistent state. And that's very important. I don't know. Uh, I've had, I, I don't want to pick on Debian. There's like so many like, Debian people here, and I love Debian, but like, have you had an apt get upgrade or an apt get dist upgrade go wrong? I have, um, and, and you know I don't want um, you know I don't want to. I love Debian. I've got to repeat that all the time. Great. So, so we captured the full dependency graph. So this is actually a graph produced by uh, by Geeks about uh, core utils, and it's kind of simplified. It doesn't include the compiled tool chain. We can see we actually um, we can a simple tool can actually generate this whole thing. There's a data structure in Geeks that represents this, and this, and so we, we can really introspect the system. You can't do this with Docker, right? You're, you're not going to have it. Um, so your profile, my profile, we have these things called profiles, which are a set of packages that each user can have. Each user could have many of them, depends on the task you want. So Chris and I can be on the same machine and using different versions of Emacs with, without, without issues, or different versions of anything, really. And we can actually have different versions of different applications linking against different versions of c share libraries. Um, so we're able to, you know, we don't have this global state of, of slash user. We don't have it. Um, so we think this gives users uh, the practical freedom uh, to have control over their software, right? I mean, how many people have had an issue where you know, they want to do development on a piece of software, but you know, the, the package they have, a version of a library they have is too old. And if they were to change it, 
they would break the rest of their distribution, right? They'd break applications that really need it. Um, yeah. yeah, so do something. A lot of hand, actually. Right. Okay, so um, yeah, transactional upgrades and rollback. So uh, <laughs> if you have a bad upgrade, which sometimes happens, I mean, you go up, uh, update a package and it didn't work, and a lot of times, unless you took a disk image beforehand, um, you're not going to get back to that state. You'll have to figure out how to kind of like undo that. Um, some, you know, sometimes like a, you know, an app get removed and then like kind of rolling back, that'll, that'll sort of help, but it's still an imperative change to like modify some things and then put other stuff back. Uh, but in Geeks, you could just say Geeks package dash dash rollback and it'll actually revert to the previous generation. It'll just basically change a pointer, a sim link to like where, you know, this profile is here. Oh, actually I want to use this one. I'm just going to switch. And so with that, you're a time wizard. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, uh, that's, that's Gerald Sussman right there, in the yeah. Dr. Who. Uh, that, that, yeah, Matt Smith, Gerald Sussman. So Matt Smith totally took his, his ideas from, from, uh, from SICP, I think. Yes. So. It's a bit of an in-joke, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, moving on. So, yeah, so in a lot of ways, this is like, this is like Git for your operating system. This is that Emacs view uh, of this, and you can see, um, you can see all these little crazy things on the, on the right here. They're different, like, hashes. So each package build has, like, a, a unique hash code associated with it. So, like, you know, Emacs built with, you know, with or without, like, X11 support is going to be a different hash code here. And, and every, you know, every, every build gets its, it's like its own little file system tree, its own little root directory. Um, you can keep history until you don't need it. On the top here, there's like a whole list of generations that, like of, of Chris's uh, Quebra's uh, profile here. And uh, when you're done with them, you can have as many as you want. And then when you want to reclaim the disk space, you can just say, I don't need these generations anymore. And the system will be free to garbage collect it. And so how many people here are developers? Develop, you know, maybe web ac applications in particular. So a lot of people, right? Um, so how many people do Python? OK, right, are you familiar with virtual env? Where it may, you know make like a you know Python environment specific to a particular project, uh, Geeks has something called Geeks environment, um, and it can, it's like virtual env but for everything, uh, so so any, any kind of software. So a really quick example, uh, I want to do some XML parsing with Ruby, uh, oh which IRB? Uh, that's the Ruby interactive shell. I don't have Ruby. Well, I can t tell Geeks environment to give me Ruby and an XML parser called Nokogiri makes a subshell. I'm like, oh, look, I have IRB now. I jump in, I require the Nokogiri library, and there I have it, and I'm off to the races, right? I can exit that and be done. In the, in the, I've never, I haven't polluted my package installation at all. That's been a, an isolated environment. And one cool thing is you can check in a little, like, geeks.scm or whatever with your, your, your repository, and anybody who comes to hack on it, they can just do geeks environment l geeks.scm and get everything you need. You know, all the C libraries, everything um, for that project and be up and hacking in minutes. So, yes, so, yeah, so like a universal virtual env. Uh, so now this is where we get a little more technical, right? Uh, Geeks is written in Scheme. Is anyone familiar with Scheme or Lisp in general? Lots of parentheses. Yeah, lots, yeah, so you know lots of the parentheses, right? So this, this is the package definition for grep. This is the real package definition for grep. It's very small. It's mostly metadata. But you see, we have a build system, the GNU build system. That's like the abstract thing that says, you know, you want to do a configure, make, make, install. So we have a very, we have a pretty expressive and pretty terse uh, language for representing these packages. And, and these aren't binaries, right? These are the recipes for how to build them from source yourself, automatically. Um, so as in addition to that, Geeks is a library. Um, all the data structures, all the procedures are exposed to you as Guile APIs. Um, so through this like low level um, API of a, of a package management, on top of it, we've been able to build declarative configuration management for your whole system, uh, universal language packaging for a variety of programming languages, local dev environments, as I mentioned, uh, local VM creation, and uh, recently Linux containers. We have a slowly evolving uh, implementation of. And so, you know, add, add your own stuff on top of this. I have a work in progress like web interface that's built on top of this. So. And I want to toss in one more yeah. thing. If you're familiar with Nix, this is the key difference between Geeks and Nix is that we have one language, a real programming language we can do all these things in, and you have the data structures, and this means, like, normally, between all these tools, it's like scar tissue to transform between them, and that's not true in Geeks. It's very easy to just import and work with those data structures, and you can build things that move between the layers very easily in Geeks in a way that's extremely painful otherwise. Yeah. Uh, for those familiar with Nix, a lot of tools, they'll take the Nix language and they'll produce an XML uh, syntax tree from it, and they have to process that and work with it. Uh, in Geeks, you just have you just have the the, the objects, the pure scheme objects. You just map the over structures. them, yeah. map filter fold all your all your friends there. Um, so this is uh, we do full system configuration management. This is actually this is the real configuration for my laptop. It's you know this this page of code. Um, so it, you know it, we have the number of packages, the users are on there, the file systems I use, my Grub configuration, all that. 
And um, you know, that, that's really it. That, like, that page of code, I run my laptop on that, I use it every day, it's great, and it's reliable. And if something goes wrong, just like with the package things, I can roll back to the previous working system from the, the grub boot menu. Not just the, the like your, your previous like select the kernel from the, the, that thing, all the packages, all the config files and everything. You upgrade yep. Media Goblin and Apache at the same time, you can move all of that back at the yep. same time, one operation. Yeah, so like real real quick example, um, recently we started to get GNOME support, but it's been like kind of shaky, so I upgraded to it, and I realized that when I closed my laptop and it suspended and I opened it back up, it would suspend again, infinitely. Wow. And that, yeah, that was really terrible. So what I did is I just I just rebooted the machine, I just picked the version that, uh, the previous instance of the system that had XFCE, and I went back to being happy. <laughs> until that problem was resolved. Uh, so, uh, Ge Geeks is really cool and all, uh, but we know that there's you know, a plethora of language-specific package managers, and they all have their own repositories, one of which is the Python package index. Um, so, in order to really benefit from Geeks, you need to import all sorts of things into Geeks. They need to be Geeks packages in order to have these you know, rollbacks and atomic upgrades and all that stuff. Um, so, in order to make people's lives easier, we're trying to make tools that allow you to semi-automatically import uh, code uh, for packages. So you can see, I can say, Geeks import PyPy Piglet. Piglet's a, a graphics programming library for Python. It spits out some scheme code. It might not be the exact thing, but pretty much all the boilerplate, some of the dependencies, uh, the hash, the source code, tarball, all that's taken care of for you. And we, we have a number of these for a variety of languages and we're improving them. So we're trying to make people's lives easy here. Um, so that's what we have. And now what's in store? Um, this, this, this is my kind of personal thing. Um, I'm working on a tool called Geeks Deploy. And what that is is a remote cluster management tool for people that know uh, Ansible or Chef or Salt, right? You, you know, you manage a whole uh, set of remote machines. We don't have that yet. We have local configuration management, but we don't have some for you know some arbitrary number of remote machines. Um, we really need that, and that's like kind of my why I want to make my big focus. Um, and, and not only it'll work for anything. It'll work on. I want it to work on bare metal VMs, containers, whatever you want. And I'll hand it over to Chris. So this one is a particular important thing for me. I described this a bit previously. I would really like to have it be easy for people to be able to select and, and, and do installations of things very simply, right? I want you to be able to say, I want Media Goblin, I want WordPress, I want blah, 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 and, uh, and just select those from a web interface or something like that and not have to repeat yourself, right? You shouldn't have to repeat, drop your, main, your domain name repeatedly and all these things. And Geeks has some tooling where there's a directed acyclic graph that um, to get technical, that can actually in, like infer variables from other things. So you can simplify the amount of steps. And if we could just expose that in a web interface, you could just fill in some variable once and the rest of the system can be smart about how it fills everything else in. And I think that's pretty important. Yeah, all right, so is anyone familiar with XDG app and their, their, their app sandboxing? All right, not really, okay. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a project by GNOME. And basically, the, you know, the idea there is to make applications that can't, uh, you know, that only have certain privileges and have as few privileges as they need to work. Um, so like, what, like, silly example, but why should the Solitaire and GNOME have access to your, you know, your GPG keys if it, if it wanted to, right? I mean, your home directory is there, it has permission to read it because it's running as your user. Um, you know, and the same thing, like, what about your web browser? You know, we find, you know, there's, there's vulnerabilities in WebKit and, and, and Gecko all the time. Um, so we want to do things like, you know, wrap, uh, you know, in our case, IceCat, you know, Firefox in a container so that it only has access to say, you know, your downloads directory in the Mozilla configuration. It couldn't touch your keys even if it was exploited. Um, yeah. So how do we make this really easy for users otherwise, right? We, it would be great if we have a graphical user interface to be able to install things. Right now, uh, my friend Ava made a joke that uh, Geeks is a little bit like Gen 2 for adults. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you, you boot up a USB key and you manually, you know, at, like partition your disk and stuff like that. And there's no reason that things have to be this way. You know, we can build easy tools and in fact the tools, probably it's even easier for us to build it because we have access to the data structures and everything. But it needs to be done. Yeah. So like, maybe if you're interested in this, you know, yeah. Please help. Yeah, please help. So, uh, um, and we, we would love to have a graphical interface for where you can do system configuration, you know, your usual packaging type stuff. But you know, why, why not? Why should you have to do geeks package dash dash rollback if you're not somebody who's familiar with the command line? It would be great to just have something in the, in the same GUI where you can just click on that and get back if things go badly. Right. Uh, so I mentioned you know we're trying to make it using a variety of different programming languages that have their own package managers easy. Uh, some languages are nice, Python uh, in particular, um, but there are others that are really difficult, and Node.js is is a big one. 
Um, the things available on, on npmjs.org, like most of the time, don't have the corresponding source code with them and other things. And uh, not only that, the dependency graphs are usually even for simple things like, oh, I want Grunt, the build system. It's like hundreds of dependencies in, in that in that graph. Um, there's a footnote here that Chris wrote about. Uh, he tried to package jQuery for geeks, and I, I forget the. The dependency tree there was like 200 something nodes. It's not so bad for geeks either. Like, I think JavaScript is really what's kept us out of Debian and like Fedora and stuff for years. Um, and we're a Python application. Yep. Uh, so J Java's also really bad. I won't get into that, but Java has a lot of like pre built jars that are in everything. And I'm convinced that no one actually knows how to build anything from source anymore in Java land. Um, <laughs> so send help. If you know these languages at all, you like really know the ins and outs of them, like we could really use your help. So let's wrap up. So the, the state of geeks, what is a state of geeks? Well, it's still beta. We switched the phrase alpha to beta very recently, but you know. <laughs> um, but you know, so, so like, what does that mean? But I mean, I actually run it on my laptop. I dual boot between Debian and Geeks SD, and most of the time I'm in Geeks SD these days, though I do sometimes move back to Debian. Um, and I would say that, you know, you know you're like, oh, well, this, I'm a little bit nervous. This seems like, you know, like it's, it's beta, but in a certain sense, People deploy all sorts of ridiculous crap on their servers right now. Uh, like, you know, I've explained some of the problems with all of them. So I think that investing in Do geeks. It every day. Yeah, if you're interested in investing in geeks, in a certain sense, I think it has a, a good foundation um, in which to be able to build upon. And we just need more tooling on top of it. Um, it's a delight to run, I do it. Um, it's very easy to develop and get involved in. Uh, our friend Ludovic, the maintainer, uh, often confusingly says, uh, Geeks is the Emacs of distros, and I think most people don't know what that means, but what he really means is that it's something that encourages users to become uh, contributors over time because it's so easy to encourage that. And uh, I think that that's one of the really key features of Geeks is that um, it's very easy to become involved in the project, and it's a very good, friendly community. Yeah, if you remember that package expression for grep earlier, a lot of simple tools are, are not more code than that, so people can actually really get involved and package something that they want that's missing without too much difficulty. And often they do that, so a lot of new contributors come in. And it's fearless to add a new package and test it because you're not going to break your system. Um, and we have about 3,350 packages now, but obviously we'd love more. Um, we have about 20 to 30 contributors per month, which is pretty good, but things are increasing pretty fast, and we would love you to become one of those ones on that number. Right, so yeah, and so here's how you can help. Um, you know, a really easy one is to just, uh, you know, test drive Geeks. Geeks will run not only on our distro that uses it, but you can, on top of any GNU Linux system, whether you're using, you know, Triscoll or Debian or Fedora, what have you, uh, we have an inst a binary installation mechanism you can use and you can run it, try it out. Or if you're brave, you know, put Geeks SD on a USB key and try to install it. Um, we have, like Chris said, we have about like a little over 3,000 packages right now, but what we really need are system services that use those packages to provide, you know, to run the, the useful daemons, like, you know, like databases and things. Um, so we need, we need more of those. We lack a lot of that, especially for web development. Um, documentation, always, you know, we have a lot of people come in and, you know, have the documentation, like, we have a nice manual, but it, it needs a lot of beefing up. So when people, when you use this, a lot of people have suggestions about how we can change the docs. We'd love patches to the code for that. Um, you can help us, if you're really technical, you can help us improve the container implementation. I'm the only one that's worked on it so far, and I'd love other people to help me add more features, make it competitive with Docker. Hey guys, we're running long time. Do you want to have questions? Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, this, is the last, this is the last slide. Okay. All right, all right. So let's, so we're, we're good. People can jump up for questions now, sure. I think. We're at the end. We'd love help, basically. Um, oh, wait. Uh, I, have, I do have a short story here. Let's take one question, and I'll see if I have time to give it. All right, go ahead. Oh, okay. wait. Oh, we have 15 minutes. Oh, we have 15 minutes, and let me tell my story, and then you can, you can go, Frank. Okay. All right, let me tell a story about this. This is, this is a, a, let's take that, that, that image from long ago, at the very beginning of this, where we saw the image of, you know, the containers on the Docker thing, or containers on anything, and let's take it to the max, right? Imagine that you run a warehouse full of containers. You have customers, and they want things. You put them into the container on one side. It's a nice black box, and you take the thing on the other, out on the other side. And you're like, this black box container is great because somebody else solved it for me. And then the foreman, and you have like thousands of these things. And then the foreman comes in and goes, ah, hey, uh, boss, uh, we got a problem here. We, uh, we, we got this shell shock or this heart bleed. Uh, we got to open up all them containers and figure out how to, how to modify them. And you're like, what? Like, I just like... The whole reason we got these things is so that I don't have to know how the, what's inside of them. And you're like, you're like, 
calling the manufacturers of the black boxes and like they're not answering their phones, right? Like, like, and you look across, you look out the window and there's a warehouse over there and you see a team of little robots and the little robots are building containers just like it except they're able to holographically project the carts so that they're not like taking up as much space and cracking the concrete. That's the dynamic versus static link part. And they've got a list of instructions and each, and, and when you say, oh no, we need to upgrade OpenSSL, they go, oh, okay, and lay it right away, boss, and they just rebuild all the containers, right? So if you saw that warehouse across the road and you look back at your warehouse, why wouldn't you move over to that model? It would be crazy not to. So this is my call against you know, statically compiled distributions as a solution. And that's it. Credits, more credits. Thank you, and questions. Frank, take it away. Hi, Frank. So um, can you go back to the slide? It's called functional. Um, um, yes. Yeah, all the way back. <laughs> 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 Time wizards. Okay, so um, so in the so in the nineties, people had a good idea how to write perfect software, and this was a simple, <laughs> and this was a simple two-step process. Step one, write the perfect specification. Step two, <laughs> do it. Right, right. Okay, so this didn't work out that well. So when I see like a first step here, write precise specific, uh, specified dependencies, it was like, hmm, that's really hard. So if I, for example, own cloud. On our side, we have a real we have trouble with the first step because writing precise specified dependencies that work in every environment for everybody with different setups, different configuration is really hard. And with really hard, I mean close to impossible. So, so, so that's my main. I mean, we know we, we package own cloud for all kinds of distributions, and we know how to package them. It's just like the world is so different. Right, but if you but if you're putting it in a Docker container, you've also precisely specified things. Absolutely, yeah, that's a See, right. So that's this not is a solution, yeah. <laughs> so well, except that we're doing that as well, but with a functional paradigm, right? We we're doing things with very precise specifications, except yeah. that it's all declared, right? So this is this is we're not we haven't given up. Uh, I think both of them end up doing precision, just one of them does it haphazardly, right? So like um, so I think that it is hard to a certain extent, except. Part of the challenges you often hit where you're trying to manage different systems is that they might have different libraries and things like that. And here, we're very carefully, like, you, can, you are free to say which specific libraries and it won't have to fight with anything else on the system. And that's one of the differences, right? Like, you don't long have to fight with the rest of the system. Um, so, like, yes, it's more work to do that and stuff like that, but if you do the work up front, you know, like, and if you included the geeks.sem, you know, assuming that all your dependencies are packaged for geeks, which might be a lot of work, but I did it for Media Goblin. You know, like, uh, we'll have Media Goblin and Geeks very shortly, I, I hope, uh, um, ignoring the JavaScript part. Uh, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, you've already done that once, and when you upgrade your things, it's, you know, just submitting a patch upstream. It's not very difficult, I think. Um, you could even provide your own geeks.scm that's independent of Geeks itself. And uh, so I think that, I think that precision is already in the system. It's just sloppy precision at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Yep. <laughs> Frank is great. Own cloud is great. We like own cloud here. Um, <clears throat> two questions that are very quick, like yes yeah. or no kind of things. Um, is it? Do you have an intentional uh, connection to content addressability um, as it's expressed by something like IPFS? Uh, because I saw you had these sort of like yeah. key-like things right. in your language. Yes, yeah, so it's not specifically, like strictly speaking, a content addressable storage system, but in it basically is. Uh, each package, each, each, each recipe has, we can identify uniquely with a hash and it goes into this like database of things. So it's, it's not exactly content addressable, but it, it is. <laughs> we, 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 we do have ways that this could end up happening, right? Like the, we could include, if we get to the point of complete reproducibility, there's no reason why we can't have a database full of like what the expected output hash is when the package is done, right? In fact, we even. I, I think that's mis yeah. Mis oh, maybe. I, I think it was kind of different, but like, uh, sorry. Okay, go uh, ahead. It is, it is a, so effectively con a content addressable storage system. Perfect. So content addressable storage is kind of like fits with your language, your yeah. functional language yes. and addressing scheme. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, scheme, Sorry. I mean. Um, yeah. The second one is, um, um, it, would I be correct? Uh, I'm like, if I were to 
the impression I get is that you're like pushing configuration to the edge. What do you mean? So, um, like Docker, mm -hmm. the configuration goes to, let's say, some expert, okay? Um, and then the Docker image is kind of like bound together in a way that's distributed the same to anybody who pulls that image down and uses it. Whereas with Geeks, it looks like what you're doing is you're pushing the, the, um, the, the language, yeah. you're, you're pushing out the, uh, the code yes. of Geeks yep. all the way down to the local machine. Yeah. Where the local machine... So, yes, the users uh, of Geeks have the, the source code to build everything themselves. Can we make that the last question and then we'll set up for the... Okay. Uh, Actually, I want to step out. Okay. okay. All right, go. But so, go so for it. Thank, thank you for your question. I, I don't think I actually finished the answer. Oh, wait. Okay. So, so you. So continue to speak. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. So the. Yes. Thank you. So, so yeah. Basically, each user of Geeks, instead of getting a binary, actually gets the full source code of Geeks. And whether or not they build that on their own machine is dependent on whether or not they trust the third party to provide them binaries. So uh, a lot of a lot of distributions are binary based. Your Debian's, your Fedora's. And uh, you, you download pre-built stuff. I mean, there's source packages and stuff, too. Uh, but, but on Geeks, by default, unless you trust someone to provide binaries, like our build farm, uh, Geeks will build everything from source, starting from the bootstrap binary. So uh, that we don't have the trusting problem as, mu as much. There. But you don't have to do everything where you compile everything by hand, because no. we do have binary substitutes available for you, which if you're familiar with it, functional programming, the binary packages are basically the memoized versions of the functional procedures, but that's getting a bit nerdy. It's a cache. Yes. Can you comment more on the relationship between Geeks and Nix? Uh, you talked a little bit. Yeah. Like, are you guys sharing implementation of some things, or are you completely re-implementing a lot of the... Like, okay, the, yeah. Okay, right. So the, the similarities. Uh, we use the, the Nix daemons code, uh, somewhat right. modified currently. Uh, we do have plans to make our own. Uh, but so, so that's a C plus, that's a daemon written in C++ that we use. We also use their um, Hydra con, um, continuous integration software. Also correct. And, but yeah, and we, we also want to have a replacement for that eventually too. But that's where the similarities end. We've replaced everything else. We've replaced all the user side tools, all of the, you know, of course, the, the language that all the package expressions are written in, uh, the build scripts, everything. But one thing is that we do owe a lot of our ideas to Nix, yes. right? Like Nix, we didn't talk about it much here because, you know, trying to save space, right? But Nix... Uh, Geeks was inspired, the core developer, the original maintainer and the current core, core developer of Geeks, Ludovic, uh, was originally a Nix developer for years, and it's because of the difficulty of building tooling on top of it that he started Geeks. Yeah. So. And of course, uh, free software, like ethical concerns too, but so. Yeah. Yep. It's also a pure system. Much easier to, it's much easier to pollute a pure system than it is to remove <laughs> impurities, it turns out. So. Yeah. Oh yeah, Ge Geeks, SD, <laughs> Geeks SD is a, a FSF certified fully free distribution, by the way. I, we should have mentioned that, but we didn't. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this may be a stupid question, but how uh, hard would it be to implement an automatic CVE check on, on each of the like, Geeks scripts? That's, right? that's a wonderful question, because we actually have a tool that does that. It's not perfect. But it actually does talk to the CVE database uh -huh. and tries to use like package metadata to say like, oh hey, uh, we have a, we have linters that check for like code style problems. But it also will talk to I think like the MITRE CVE database and be like, hey, you didn't patch this, or we didn't we think you didn't patch this. It's not 100 percent, but yeah. yeah, yeah. So it could maybe use some tweaking, but we yeah we're already in that direction. Yeah. Uh, so how quickly or how easy is it currently or planned to like mix like sysadmin? install packages with user install packages? Like you mentioned, right. you don't need privileges okay. for this. Okay, so, so, so let's imagine a scenario where you've got, you know, you, your system and then it's like, we're a GCC4 shop. And you're like, but I need GCC5 to compile this, right? You know, and it's no problem. Because you can install GCC4 and effectively you've got that slash GNU store and a whole bunch of hash is inside of it, right? And your profile is just a symlink forest. It just points into those hashes. And those hashes point at each other. Right, so when your profile in general, like you're, you'll normally be using core utils and everything else like that. But when you say geeks package dash i gcc and you pull down the gcc five, it doesn't conflict with anybody else on the system, um, and you will end up at that point. You know, if you have something on top of that, the trees will diverge up there. But otherwise, else you still end up sharing everything beneath it. So you can maximize as much shared stuff up until the point where you don't want to anymore, 
Okay. And then, uh, um, then so, and then you can diverge. And can you ma can you mask off packages that you don't want showing up or you uh, like like like, like Gentoo style? Yes. Um, you could just not install them. I mean, like you have full control over like what what you pick to to have installed. You so, could like you, you could you couldn't say I don't want to use anything that uses Python. I mean, we don't have something like that. No. Okay. Yeah. You could walk the graph though and see whether or not your your profile has it in there. We though. have no built-in tool. Yeah. So I'm running Geeks right now. Uh, oh. Yeah. Woo. Oh. Uh, Homework, everyone. <laughs> install Geeks. So I saw on the Leader Planet uh, pamphlet, I was like, oh, I might as well see what it's like. Well, actually, I had it for a few months now. Okay. I don't have point nine yet. Yeah. But uh, I noticed it has transactional upgrades and uh, yeah. uh -huh. rollback. Yeah. yeah. I've never seen rollback in, in a distro before. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, now that it's, you're adding e uh, Emacs commands and stuff and it's becoming more user friendly, what's the next step? Because well, uh, are we going to add uh, so, so we've got a, well, okay. It's, e so you, you kind of almost answered it right there. Like, now that we have Emacs commands and it's more user friendly, Geeks is great if you're an Emacs user, right? Like, yes. we have an amazing Emacs user interface. <laughs> Turns out not everybody uses Emacs, right? Which is one of my complaints. <laughs> Which is one, one of my complaints to Ludovic saying it's the Emacs of distros. I'm like, I'm not sure you're capturing the full audience that could be interested in this. But, uh, um, but you, I mean, you can still use a command line and stuff like that. But it would be great to have all of those wonderful things that you can currently do in the Emacs interface. Like we, we showed this much earlier, right? You know, you can, be, you can uh, do something like this where you have the different profiles and you can even diff them. That's something we didn't mention, right? Yes. You're dipping things. That's what it was. I, I have a web interface prototype. It's not really usable, but I got to the point where you could actually install packages with it and look at your profile generation. So and it was oh, some, only, something like that we just need and to it was only, do more. It was a very small amount of code to get able to get that. I saw a, de a demo by uh, Ludovic Cortez. Yes. Yeah, he, he, did did a, Boston, he did yeah. a diff, and he also did a command where he could list all of his yeah. packages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. And so we, we'd like to continue in that direction to make that more exposed. I want to get to Stefano, and then we should wrap up. Yep. So, okay. so thank you. Thank yeah. you. So I have a question about the case where security updates get difficult. Like, for instance, if you one of the security updates you have to do is basically imposing an API breakage that will need to be fixed by someone. Right. And, you know, that can potentially ripple down. So that's the real case, which is complicated for traditional distro to deal with. So I wonder if there is something specific in Geek that make for package maintainers easier to address those cases. To do security updates? Not, not security yeah. updates in general. So when security updates like break the API of packages that, use, that depend. Okay. Uh, we have both. So, yeah. So yeah we okay. have both cases, so, both when the API doesn't change and when it does. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so since we have this whole, that whole idea of the dependency graph mm -hmm. thing, when you, when you update, you know, let's say open SSL in the tree, um, that'll change the, uh, the hashes of every single thing that depends on it. So if you wanted to build, you, you, sure. you could, uh, our CI system will rebuild the whole tree. That, that got changed, and it'll, it'll tell you what has broken or what hasn't. No, so that, that I understand, but the point okay. is whether if the, the rebuild of the dependent packages does not work automatically, and you still need to have the maintainer change something in the build rules to adapt or that kind of stuff. Oh, and like, the, like change the build recipe? Yes, for instance. Yeah, so we, I, that, that graph example was very simplistic. You can actually tweak all of the parameters okay. of that and actually add new code in to, to pass to the build daemon. But to in the that build. case, before being able to have everything fixed, you still need to have the maintainers of every single package like deal with the package before the uh, fix gets to the users, right? Sure, we could do that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then in the case of not breaking an API, we have something called graphs, yeah. which, which will do a replacement. But yeah. maybe we should talk about it after? Yeah, sure. sure. That'd be great, thank you for your question. Yeah. That's a good one. All right, on that note, let's end this talk. This is a great turnout, great audience. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to James. Thank you, everybody. Great talk. Thank you, Larry Planet and FSF staff. Five.